thank you for uh, for having me. It's it's uh, a pleasure being here, and I look forward to the conversation. All right, great. So we're going to dig in with just a little bit of context. I'm going to provide some kind of let's think of it as level setting statistics around where we're at as we come to the end of the crazy year that 2020 has been and how we're looking towards 2021. And as we were preparing to have this conversation, Dave made what I thought was a really brilliant statement in saying that 2021 is shaping up to be even bumpier than 2020 was. So uh, we're gonna dig into that a little bit and I'll set the, set the stage here with some statistics and then we're just gonna have some dialogue uh, around some key questions that we feel like are really going to be um, things we need to be thinking about as, as we think about engineering, product development, how we're gonna architect things like data, um, artificial intelligence, and just a myriad of different things from a technology perspective. And underscored with this element of the need for leaders, um, particularly those leaders with technology knowledge, to step forward and to really play a strong role in 2021. So with that, let's think about uh, this quote from the CEO of Splunk, Doug Merritt. I try to lead from a place of optimism, imagination, and recreation. And I think that that's a really great way for us to think about how we go into 2021 as we think about the disruption that has happened in these kind of three areas, um, digital transformation. Digital transformation has accelerated uh, like crazy over 2020. We're going to talk about economic turmoil. That is a significant, you know, it's having a significant role in what's happening on a global scale. And then talent, look what's happened as we have had to shift so many of our workers into a work from home environment. And what are we going to do with talent as we think about um, reintegrating people into more traditional work environments as we're coming out of, um, as we're coming out of the pandemic? And how are we gonna deal with this explosion of need for technology talent? So here's a, a good picture from a CIO CTO survey where 55% of them indicated that they had accelerated adoption of cloud computing. 52% have accelerated adoption of 5G, which as we know is a, is a huge enabling technology for many of the other things that need to happen. And then 51% accelerated artificial intelligence and machine learning efforts. Um, this is this is a massive change. So it's a really good way for us to think about how critical are the changes that are taking place. Additional technologies that are being adopted, 42% of them said that they uh, that they have introduced new technologies into their environment. Um, ex speeding up the adoption of IoT, 35% of them said that they've been done this and that they've adopted augmented and virtual reality. You know, a year ago, this was in, this was expected to be far into the future that we were seeing the level of adoption of AR and VR that, that happened this year. So that's a big change. I think this is an impactful view as well. 44% of those who would usually wait to buy new technologies and this is actually a consumer view, uh, have now shifted into an early adopter attitude. This is a major change from the past, 44%. Um, in a McKinsey study, this just came out in November, 50% of those that they surveyed reported that their companies have adopted artificial intelligence at, in at least one core business function. And that 22% of them said that it has impacted their EBIT. So we're talking about direct impact upon uh, these organizations' abilities to be profitable and financially sustainable moving forward. Now here's where we start to talk about where maybe the wheels are a little bit coming off, <laughs> coming off the bus because we're going at a breakneck speed. 
So which functions uh, from an artificial intelligence modeling perspective misperformed during COVID-19? So 32% of the models inside of marketing and sales were thought to have had some kind of a glitch that they misperformed. And 21% in product and service development and 19% in service operations. So these are some indicators of the fact that we, we innovated, we responded quickly from a technology perspective but we also are experiencing some pains as a result of having done that. So based on that, based on that kind of backdrop, uh, Dave, I would, I'd love to hear what you think um, coming out of COVID and looking into 2021, thinking about things like estimating demand growth and supply chain effects, labor needs, and this massive uncertainty that we've talked about, uh, the status quo obviously won't work. So what are what plans do you think are going to lead to success in 2021? Well, um, uh, going back to your statement uh, that you made earlier about uh, the uh, prep for, for this discussion, the statement I made, um, and I think this is a bit provocative, but I'm sticking with it. <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, I think coming out of COVID in 2021 um, will be a bigger challenge um, for companies uh, than going into uh, COVID. And I say this for a variety of reasons. Um, and if you just take a look at a couple of things, number one, um, bankruptcies, uh, particularly in the, in the retail space, right? We've seen 40 plus retailers in the US alone, that's just the US, it's not a world view. So just the US that have filed bankruptcy in 2020. So their plans for restructure alone are gonna cause um, great uncertainty. Number two, inventory. Inventory has been spiky all during COVID um, and getting back to normal forecasting can pose serious challenges for most companies. Number three, remote work, you talked about it earlier, Lisa, right? And yeah. what I'm hearing from clients across the board is that, you know, they're not going back in January or February. It's, they're pushing that out. And in some cases, they're pushing it out into the third or even fourth quarter of 2021. And when they do return, you know, they may be returning to new org structures, um, new locations, right? Because some of their uh, office space may have been sold for economic purposes, right? To save money. Um, and they may be coming back to all kinds of new budgets and new strategies. Um, the, the fourth point is around, and this is specifically to retail, is around third party fulfillers. So you think about um, the rise of third party fulfillment with the likes of Instacart and DoorDash and Shipped I mean, these companies are emerging in, in a very, very quick way. Um, these are all adding new business models, new ways of working, new changes, new, new um, uh, uncertainty in the marketplace. And then finally, uh, politics, right? Not taking any side red or blue here, <laughs> but we do have a new administration that's coming in and that transition is going to create some uncertainty. So when you, when you kind of look at the, the totality of all of the market dynamics that are happening um, now and into 2021, there's lots of change, there's lots of uncertainty. And that's why I say coming out of COVID could be rather bumpy. And, and think about this, right? For those companies that don't want to embrace change and want to remain status quo, right, with respect to their, their plans and their business models, I think they'll experience not just a bumpy ride, but a turbulent re-entry. And, and even possibly see the demise of their businesses if they're not if they're not willing to really step forward with some creativity and some innovation. I, I, I share some concerns with you in this space, Dave, because I feel like if we, uh, if we don't get this message across that returning to some normal is not ever going to really be normal, that you've got to have adjusted and changed. Um, and, and specifically when I'm thinking about 
technology from a data perspective, from a machine learning and artificial intelligence lens, if we haven't adjusted our models properly and are continually looking for those mechanisms to move ourselves forward into, uh, into the new reality that's been created, I fear for organizations that aren't embracing the change. So as I think about that, these organizations that are winning are and reallocating resources uh, are the ones who are really seeing, you know, that these the organizations that are willing to step forward into this unchartered land and be creative are the ones that we're really seeing be successful. So you know, what are you know, thinking about some examples of this and ways that organizations have really been creative? You know, there's there was some great research that came out from Gartner that talked about the shift that happened, and they they interviewed 2,000 CIOs from top performing enterprises and talked about digital innovation. And this the study just came out in October. I think it's a, ex, exceptionally timely. But they were talking about the fact that those organizations where their technology leaders really stepped forward and took a, um, took a leadership role. So whether that be a product manager, uh, whether it be somebody that is embedded in your IT organization, whether you're talking about data architects, data scientists, engineers, et cetera, when those individuals have a vision for what can happen and are bold enough to step forward with that vision, that's when we really start to see these organizations have these, you know, these kind of breakout ideas and innovations. So, I, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, ask for the example here, Dave, for you to jump in with regard to the e-commerce e solution that PepsiCo brought to, brought to market. Yeah, it was a, it was a great uh, example of, uh, as you just mentioned, um, leadership and, and, and doing something at a time uh, that was uncertain. Um, and, and, and PepsiCo during the month of, uh, I think either May or June of this year, uh, came forward and uh, brought a couple of different uh, DTC or, or e-commerce models to life. Um, one on the beverage side, one on the snack side. And if you think about, you know, doing that in a, in a relatively uncertain time when they probably didn't have all things buttoned up, right? I'm sure that they didn't have everything finalized. They didn't have anything, everything perfect. It probably wasn't on the roadmap to launch at that time. It was probably several months later or maybe even into 2021. Um, but they stepped forward and during a very difficult time launched. And I thought it was a great representation of um, tremendous courage and leadership on their part to do something um, that very few actually did in that moment. Because if you think back during that time, everyone was still trying to figure out, okay, how do we get people back to work? How do we um, uh, get our supply chains uh, running somewhat normally so that we can deliver products to, to retail shelves where consumers can continue to buy? Um, I thought it was a fabulous example. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a fantastic example. And I think about all of the roles of individuals who really had to demonstrate courage in that moment to step forward yeah. with something that they knew was not going to be perfect when they took it to market. Right. Yeah, and it goes back to reinforce uh, the quote that you uh, put up at the, at the beginning uh, from uh, your CEO around um, uh, optimism, imagination, and, and uh, in and recreating, kind of reimagining what is the art of the possible in a, in a moment uh, where things are in limbo. And right. uh, again, it was a uh, really cool example of what can be done in, in difficult times. Absolutely. Really like that example. And I think that for individuals that are, if you have a great idea, this is the time to step forward. Right. I think that this we, we're in a period of time where we're in inflection has been created and we need that kind of bold leadership and exemplified 
uh, by PepsiCo in that example. So let's let's pivot a little bit from a topic perspective and let's dig into decision science, Dave. This term has gained in popularity. Um, what does that mean within the pandemic context to you? And how are savvy technologists gonna use this pivot to benefit their organizations? Yeah, well, I, I completely agree with you that, <laughs> that the science of data and analytics has grown in popularity over the last several years. Um, but there still remains uh, countless challenges when you look at um, uh, you know, companies that are medium to large in size and, and the ones that I deal with on a regular basis. Um, even a couple of years ago, right? This is just a couple of years ago. Uh, I, I saw big companies struggle with decision and, and or data science, depending on how you want to frame that, right? That term. These companies are still using Excel, Excel to run their businesses, to do their demand forecasting or supply sensing. Um, few skilled individuals uh, are on the payroll. And, and I'll give you an, a, a really good example. I was consulting for a large consumer package company and found out that they only had three data scientists on staff. Three, three, see, three, <laughs> yeah. three individuals. Now, mind you, this is a very large consumer um, packaged goods company, extremely prof profitable, proud history, yet they struggled with the technical aspects of data science and didn't exactly know how to leverage this, the new skill sets to their advantage. Um, so good example of that. Um, look, I think we all know that the pandemic accelerated, right? Most companies' digital transformation plans by two to three years minimum. And some people say by four or five years, depending on who you talk to. Uh, Doug McMillan, uh, the CEO of Walmart just said, I think it was uh, two, three weeks ago that um, he, he, he confirmed it has accelerated their digital transformation plans by three years. Um, if you take and, and think about an analogy of driving a car, it's like going from first to fourth gear in milliseconds, <laughs> right? So, so what does that mean, right? What does that mean? The smart companies are gonna leverage data and analytics in a much more profound way. The other companies though, on the other end of that spectrum, um, really need to change their paradigms to think about data, not just as some bits and bytes that's taking up a lot of space in their lakes and repositories and clouds, right? But believing that it's their most important and precious asset, right? In the last few years, you've heard cloud first, cloud first, cloud first, right? Um, right. Well, I think the pivot is actually analytics and insight first. Cloud's an enabler. It's the insights you gain from advanced analytics that deliver the newfound value um, for your organization. Yeah, it's really true. I, I like to think of cloud, you, you can't be successful with a cloud strategy if you don't have a data strategy. Yeah, so, absolutely. You know, making sure that you are thinking through that carefully about what is your data strategy um, and combining that with the enablement that cloud brings to the table. It's a really, really powerful combination. Um, I, I, when we think about data and artificial intelligence, I, I like to think about everything from a real-time decisioning perspective. So when you think about that, Dave, what are some, what are some examples of ways that we're you know, using real-time information and, and data and AI to inform our decision-making? Well, the short answer is limitless. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there are unlimited possibilities, um, but let, let me give you a couple of examples of how AI and advanced analytics are being used in real-time decisioning. Uh, and, and for the audience here, Many of you will recognize and, and understand some of these examples that I'm talking to you about. Some of them are not as new as, as what you might think, but they're very powerful in the sense of the value and, and, um, uh, and the difference that it makes, that it's bringing to 
individuals either in enterprises or in regular consumer uh, space, right? So the first one is around commercial aviation. Um, many airlines are using sophisticated AI and ML-based algorithms to find the smoothest path, right? For the trips that you take on business or the trips you take with your family on vacation. In this same industry, pilots are now using apps to inform them of the optimal gas load that they need to put on the plane before takeoff. In the past, there was, there was no pilot decision in that equation, right? Every plane, regardless of its destination, international, domestic, didn't matter. Every plane was filled full, right? Um, but with AI and advanced analytics built into flight apps, right? Now on iPads and other devices, pilots now can make decisions um, based on that fuel load and actually, and, and there's, there's a threshold of safety there, right? So they can't put half, right? right? But there is, a, there, is a, there is a threshold there where they can help save the company billions of dollars over the course of an entire year. On a personal level, my brother is a pilot for Delta, right? And I've talked to him frequently about this topic many, many times about using these new analytical tools that he's, you know, allowed to use now and he's all over it. He, he's yeah. embraced it. He loves being part of the equation that's driving increased value to his organization. And it's not just Delta. There are many um, uh, airlines that have uh, embraced this and are using these new AI and advanced techniques. So that's a really cool example. Um, another one is in the automobile industry. Um, I think everyone on this webinar probably knows or should recognize that the amount of data and analytics that are now part of cars that you drive every single day, I mean, it's here. <laughs> um, and not, I'm not even talking about the autonomous vehicles. I'm just talking about the ones that we drive um, and, the, and the numerous sensors that are now on the cars, right? That are helping drivers stay in the lanes. They're helping with backup knowledge, with um, speed control, and uh, encroaching vehicles, right? And, and then the list keeps growing, right, over time. So this is all about real-time inputs that are translated in milliseconds to understandable outputs, right? So the driver, you and me, the driver of the car can react and take the appropriate action, right, immediately. Um, and by the way, the average car, if, if you know, anyone is, is questioning how many sensors does the average car have, um, it's up to about a hundred sensors now, um, but that will probably double in the next, uh, you know, few years. So, so that's another great example of everyday life and how AI and advanced analytics is really um, changing things for the better. Um, I'll keep going. Uh, there's <laughs> one, <laughs> there's, I'm, there's I'm gonna I'm gonna add a couple and make oh, a, sure. make a point there too, Dave. The um, the this ability to everything you've described there, there are product managers involved in those processes who said, hey, here's some really great new capability we can bring to the table. And this is, I, I love the pilot example. I love the car example. I'll extend the car example. Um, McLaren Racing, for example, at every race that they run they have sensors on every piece of every piece of equipment inside of their cars that it's possible to put a sensor on they are gathering petabytes of data during one race yeah. to that is provi that's providing input into a real time operation center that allows them to see and make adjustments to a, to um, elevate their ability to race to the absolute top of their field, right? So racing isn't something we obvious that we think of as an obvious place to see that real-time decisioning, but it's live and it's happening. Another one that I think is fantastic is an example with wildfires. So as we know, all along our West Coast here in the United States, we've really been struggling with wildfires and what has happened now is there's a convergence of IoT, Internet of uh, Things technology, uh, the high transmission, so 5G technologies, and this uh, ability for us to gather data in real time 
that allows, so imagine that somebody goes out and puts sensors in the ground along the entire path of the electric transmission lines that are often the root cause of these fires. And those sensors are tied back into an operation center where any change in temperature allows you to see immediately on that operations control center board where you are potentially seeing a fire start. And being able to map over top of that your weather data that says, hey, the, the wind is blowing south, southwest, and so that you know exactly where to deploy resources. So if you're a a frontline firefighting organization, they know exactly where to go to control those fires before they get out of hand. So, you know, these are really creative ways for us to, uh, to use data um, in, in very real time fashion. So as we, as we think about the, some of the, these different challenges, Dave, what surprised you in this space compared to your initial expectations? Um, so <laughs> there's there's a couple <laughs> of surprises, um, and one is, and there still remains, even with the rapid escalation of digital transformation plans, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the major challenge that most clients face with respect to data and analytics is is um, unifying all the data. So, so yeah. bringing it all together. Um, and, and, you know, crazy as it sounds, it's a very difficult challenge that most clients face today. You know, they've got data in numerous repositories, lakes, clouds, and, and companies are spending fortunes on egress and ingress charges, moving that data here and there to perform analytics. So that, that is a, a, a real obstacle um, that a lot of companies face today. An, another one, um, and, it's, and it's highly correlated to the, to the first point I made, is, is that nearly 80% of companies um, don't or can't operationalize their advanced analytics, meaning they can't put their algorithms to work, right? So uh, you know, we all know that, that there's all kinds of testing and trialing and POCs that are going on with uh, most companies, right? Medium and large size companies, sophisticated companies. But rarely do you find a large percentage of these companies putting the, these tested and proven algorithms into motion, right? And, and yet this is where the value realization comes from. You know, go back to, um, uh, well, I, I was going to talk about an example um, uh, about a company that uh, had SKU rationalization as, as an exercise. And, and um, one of the things that, uh, um, that happened during this exercise is there was a, a really cool algorithm that was developed. And it was highly functional. And, and incredibly valuable, but the company never put it into production. Um, and guess what? When COVID hit, they were on their heels. Um, and so, you know, this, this exercise happened a couple of years ago. And when COVID hit, they, they were challenged, right? So being able to use all of the data, being able to unify it and bring it together, and then putting your algorithms, operationalizing those, uh, into motion is, uh, you know, a couple of real challenges. And that kind, that kind of continues to surprise me in the industry. So building on that, building on that, Dave, how can product managers, engineers, and data scientists, how can they use augmented intelligence? And so I think of augmented intelligence as people plus AI. Yep. Uh, how can they use that to create new opportunities for their businesses and for their own roles? Well, I, I think the key is collaboration, Lisa. Um, when, you, when you talk about product managers, engineers, data scientists, um, they have to exchange ideas with, with frontline associates who are closest to the problem, closest to the issue. Um, if you're a consulting company, then you've got to get close to your client. Um, uh, if you are a product company, you got to get close to the, to the customer who's using it, right? They're the ones that will be able to tell you where the pain points are, where they exist. 
Uh, knowing these problems is foundational for innovation and breakthrough thinking. Um, and a methodology that, that I like to use, particularly on the consulting side, is design thinking because it's 100% focused on the user. Uh, and the user is the person who actually does the stuff. They make the stuff, right? Um, they get blocked by all these obstacles, crazy obstacles that, that pop up here and there that, that no one else sees. And if product managers, data scientists, engineers um, don't understand where these challenges uh, and big roadblocks exist, then nothing changes with product evolution, right? Everything just kind of stays the same. You don't, you don't have those leapfrog moments in time. Um, and let me, let me give you a couple of examples, right? Um, the first is about a package uh, ship, is about package shipping, right? So there's a, there's a very large package uh, company that had hundreds, and I mean hundreds of employees that were looking at packages that originated from an overseas country destined to the US. So those packages were, were coming to the US, right? And due to various laws, um, every package that, that was destined to the US had to be unpacked, inspected, repacked, relabeled, and then shipped to the US. Right? Again, this took hundreds, it's an army of people who were, who were doing these things, right? Um, and so um, there was a better way. And, and a diverse um, team with, with, with different skill sets, and I'm talking about data scientists, engineers, product managers, product specialists, business transformation consultants, and customer experience specialists all got together. They were assembled and they started conducting due diligence with the client in the form of um, field studies and interviews. And, um, and they did that because they wanted to understand and identify where the pain points occurred in this process with these hundreds of people that were actually doing you know, this type of work. Um, and so once they knew that, they could actually completely transform how this work was to be executed and they inserted um, new technology, new, you know, really advanced optical scanners, censored scales, and sophisticated algorithms that learn over time. The bottom line value is that they were able to uh, reduce the, the numbers of people, the headcount by a dramatic number, and increase the inspection accuracy at the same time. So this saved the company millions and millions of dollars. And I'll give you a sec second example. And this goes back to the, um, the, the, the recent example I gave on the SKU rationalization with this large CPG company, right? So they, they were using Excel to figure out how to rationalize their portfolio of products. It took them a year to go through this exercise, a year. And once they finished, they, they were actually able to identify a hundred products in that portfolio that could be trimmed. Um, but the problem is, is that the analysis didn't provide a confidence level, had no predictive capability built into it, and couldn't give any assurances of accuracy over a time horizon. I'm talking a year or two out, right? When you look in the horizon. So enter a team of four individuals, two data scientists, a really savvy business analyst who just graduated from college <laughs> and a smart project manager. Average age of this group was about 29 years old, okay? Much younger than me. <laughs> and in five weeks, remember it took the CPG company a year, in five weeks, this team was able to develop an ML-based algorithm that identified 300 products, 200 more than the original list that should be terminated from the portfolio and did it by predicting a year out, a year horizon, right, with a 90% confidence level. Wow. It was this incredible work, incredible example of how AI can be leveraged to drive huge, huge benefit. That, that's a fantastic example. I think that, you know, when we think about situations, uh, one of the surprises for me this year has been how tolerant customers have been uh, and willing to take something that isn't perfect, that done is better than perfect. And when we see that kind of customer intimacy mentality 
to put your customer at the forefront, whether that's an internal customer inside your organization or whether that's ultimately the customer, an external customer you're trying to serve. But to see these organizations really put their customers um, in the center of their mindset and come up with these really creative solutions that allow for uh, that allow for them to create impact, positive impact for the customers, and the customers have been willing to work with them. You know, I think that's been one of the surprises for 2020 is that there has been a, you know, more of a get in the trenches with the providers mentality from the customers. That's been a nice surprise for me where I think in the past there's been less willingness to accept anything less than perfect, particularly from, uh, from American consumers. And I think we've seen that shift. And so when you combine that with these fantastic teams that are creating these collaborative ideas and, and combine that with this openness to everything not being perfect the first time from a customer perspective, I think we're in a really unique time in history that those, for those individuals that are willing to step forward and be, be thoughtful and um, bold in what they bring forward, it's, it is an exciting time to be a technologist, to be somebody that has ideas that maybe um, haven't been 100% perfect yet, and, and this is the perfect environment to try those out. So, yeah, I, I, I would agree with you, um, and I think if, if, if you just take a look at retail, for example, in, in the pandemic, um, you know, it forced companies, whether they, whether they were ready or not, it forced companies to, to kind of radically alter or think about what the future holds for particularly their e-com platforms. Um, they did not have um, uh, plans in place during the months of you know may june july august right even up to now uh for the things that they wanted to do uh in 2020 Th those were actually on the roadmap for 21 22 and 23 but it forced them to radically change their their mindset their thinking and to and to and to and to move forward with with plans that they had on the shelf waiting for another couple of years and they they you know instituted those as quickly as possible and to your point yeah. not everything not everything was perfect right i mean how many times did you order online for groceries and you know during the early days of the pandemic you saw wait times for delivery and or pickup in in at, at you know uh, buy online pickup at store right pickup at the store you had to wait um, not just a couple of hours, but days and sometimes weeks. In Canada, there was a retailer that was two weeks out, right? So you order it and then two weeks, you'd pick it up, right? That's the kind of uh, radical transformation that, that these companies had to um, uh, think about and, and actually move forward with um, given, given the, the set of circumstances that, that, was just, that was thrown at them. That's a fantastic example. I know for myself, uh, I saw some of those lead times be pretty long early on, and now they're able to do it um, within hours. It's been, it, it's the ability to move forward quickly and to address their customer concerns has been so impressive. So I'm going to, um, I really appreciated the conversation, Dave. I'm going to provide just some wrap up thoughts here. If you're somebody who's a product manager, a, a, a data scientist, an, an engineer, an architect, if you're, uh, you know, if you're leading these teams, our challenge to you is this: change your mindset, and make sure that you are thinking about how to really help your organization to thrive in 2021. Uh, don't think of your role as a, you know, as a backseat or as somebody that is necessarily receiving um, direction, but I really challenge you to step forward and bring your ideas to the table if you haven't yet. And I'm sure many, many of you are already doing this, but really make sure that you're thinking about things from a leadership perspective 
if you need to double or triple your budget to be able to meet customer expectations, put, the, put a plan together and ask for that. I just really challenge you to think outside the box. Take a role that you maybe haven't taken in your organization in the past. Create a vocabulary for yourself and your team and for those that you interact with that helps to create a vision for what is possible. Make sure that you're educating yourself with regard to your overall organization's objectives and what has to be done for you to be successful as we're facing bumpy 2021. Um, plug in experts, meaning look into your organization for communications experts and for change management experts and pull them into these conversations so that together you can build a plan that will really help you to make an impact in 2021. Present your ideas, believe in yourselves, your organizations, your customers, and your partners need you to really be bold at this point in history. So with that, Alec, I'll hand it back over to you. I think we've got some Q&A coming our way. Excellent, thank you, really, really appreciate that. And it kind of reminds me of, uh, of the saying, if you wanna go fast, uh, go alone. If you wanna go far, uh, bring others. And uh, a lot of people in the technical space can sometimes get really excited and focused on uh, a particular problem they're looking at, but it's good to kind of get that holistic view of the company as you were saying, like what will actually help a lot of people within the company? What is actually connected to the, to the revenue? And then through that lens, look at what, what you're building and, and make sure you're focused on like the most impact for, for the company not just necessarily like for, for your day-to-day -day or, or your team. So re really, really think that's great advice. I, I saw one of the early questions from, uh, from Tom. It says, given the challenges that, that medium to large companies are having with data science, how are the smaller groups like medium to small companies, even NGOs and nonprofits going to survive? Like what, what, are, what are some things that they can do with the resources that they have available to, to gain some success? I'll, I'll jump in and take that. Um, I think there are a number of ways that even small companies, uh, and I'm talking even startups, right? So whether you have, you know, 30 employees and you're uh, running on a shoestring budget <laughs> and you may have 5 million or 10 million in revenue uh, at the top line, um, even those kinds of small companies, even though they don't have a lot of dollars to spend, they can get really creative on how to um, how to collaborate uh, using diverse sets of skill sets and whether they have those inside their company or they can find somebody outside of their company that they know in their community um, or uh, perhaps even, uh, you know, a sister uh, or partner company uh, uh, if, if they're uh, working with a VC or, or a private equity group. Um, there's a lot of individuals that know, um, you know, some, uh, some skill sets that could come in and help them for uh, you know, not, not many dollars. Um, the key uh, is really collaborative um, and, and diverse sets of skill sets that come together. Um, to me, that's where the sparks ignite. That's where uh, real innovation can be found and where you can unleash uh, tremendous value into the organization regardless of its size. That diversity of thought piece is so important. I love that you called that the spark, Dave. I think that that's a great way to describe it. Um, in the NGO space specifically, I would encourage organizations to look for availability of partners and reduced cost situations that are specific to NGOs. There are many organizations of significant size now who are particularly focused on being purpose oriented and helping to support NGOs in their missions as part of their core business, um, as part of their part of their uh, core business functions and focus. So, I don't know if everyone had seen this, but in 2019, 181 of the world's largest organizational organization CEOs signed a compact to be focused on being purpose-oriented in addition to profit-oriented. So 
that was a pretty major pivot that happened actually right before uh, the pandemic started to impact the globe so critically. So I really encourage you in the NGO space to look to look for partners and to look for creative solutions. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is a bit specific, so um, I'm not sure if you, you guys will have an answer, but related to the, the discussion on sensors, um, what would it take to implement fire sensor data into, into prediction products? Um, Nahid said most people are using a local fire department data or NASA fire data but they're not, they're not actually getting like the, the real time data from, from sensors. So what, what are some of like the steps or uh, ways to, to do that? Um, and it's probably could be generalized to any sort of sensor project, not, not just fire. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, jump in and, and thank you very much for the, the question, Naid. Um, I have an example I wanna share with you, and this is a couple of years old, actually it's like three years old. Um, where I actually was consulting with a large heavy industry company, um, and, and, and it was in the cement industry of all places. <laughs> um, uh, but I'll 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 kind of string this together and connect the dots for you. Um, you know, the, in the cement industry, when you when you go to a cement plant, it's gigantic. It's it's enormous, right? Um, and there are workers everywhere. It's a very dangerous place to work. Um, and, and so we were talking uh, to the, uh, the company about actually leveraging sensors on uh, and putting them, embedding them in protective clothing. Um, and so when an individual worker would go out um, into the, uh, the operation, no matter where they were at, right, um, the sensor would pick up location, um, and, but also it would pick up things like uh, temperature, um, air quality, uh, it would it would uh, actually determine fall. So if someone fell, um, depending on height levels, right, that the sensor picked up, you could determine that very quickly. And and of course time. So temperature is really interesting because it gets a little bit to your point around fire, uh, you know, safety. Um, the data feeds that we were that we were getting from sensors uh, were uh, telling. Um, the control headquarters, the control tower, how long and how hot a certain area was. And, and there, are, there are a select uh, few places within the, um, the cement uh, factory where uh, you know, there's high heat and you can only, and a worker can only stay in those locations for a very short period of time. And then, you know, as soon as they approach that kind of red line to that metric, they, they got to get out, right? Um, and so, those kinds of things are, are actually in in play right now at large manufacturing companies, you know, these big heavy industry companies. Um, I don't see it, you know, you asked the question, how, how, how far out do you, do you see this? I think it's right around the corner where you're going to start to see a lot of this technology get embedded into fire protection, fire safety um, products. And, uh, and that to me is, is, is the beauty of technology. And the advancement of, um, you know, AI and and just advanced analytics and the sensors and how you bring all of that together for the benefit of, uh, of you, of me, of consumers, of enterprises. Great points, Dave. Um, I'll add that smart. I think that this ties into a lot of what we're seeing in public sector around things like smart city initiatives, mm -hmm. and the ability to, you know, this there are so many possible use cases for sensors with regard to public health and safety. So, you know, one that's a really popular smart city example uh, is to be able to keep more of our aging population in their homes, which is where they want to be, and leveraging sensors uh, on, their, on their doors, on the gates to their yard, on, um, uh, on clothing even, with regard to if they go outside or using geospatial information, if they leave a certain geofencing area, um, that people would be notified and that there would be a series of steps taken, you know, process oriented automation to help these people to in those situations where they might 
uh, where they might be in danger and otherwise be able to happily live in their homes. So I think that we're going to see a lot of, and these, these smart city initiatives have been on, on the radar for, you know, they've been very popular since at least 2017. So we're seeing a long period of time already leading up to potential for these types of sensor related situations and the data gathering to be able to create impact at again a real time decisioning you know from a real time decisioning perspective and to drive actions at the moment that something is happening so i'm with dave i think that we're right on the cusp of these things becoming really common um, in in our environments and i I actually think that finances are going to, you know, are getting to the point where we're going to see financial drivers versus financial impedance um, as things like the ability to, you know, uh, to stop wildfires and all of the financial damage that comes from that uh, to be able to keep people in their homes where it's less expensive and they're happier to be there. I think that we're at a place where we're right on the cusp of these things all coming together and starting to drive some really positive impacts for humanity based on what's possible with data, machine learning, and AI. Great, thank you. So I, I know we're a bit over, but I wanted to uh, get to one one last question, and uh, we'll uh, we'll end with that. So. There's often very proprietary ways that people consider data and their data models. They make it for their own company. We've seen kind of research type uh, examples like ImageNet and those have led to an explosion of improvements where kind of everyone's able to benefit. How, how do we get more of that? How do we change that culture where companies don't just uh, run their own data and their own models? There's, there's more sharing and we can get some, some greater good out of it. I think, I, do you mind if I jump in, Dave? Yeah, go ahead. So, you know, this is a fantastic question. And one of the, one of the areas where I feel like we're seeing some uh, positive movement are the partnerships that we're seeing between large technology companies and universities and nonprofits to create some of these open sourced data um, you know, curated data environments that can be leveraged and, and obviously not in a proprietary fashion. So I think that those partnerships have really started to take root and we're beginning to see some movement that will help to create at least um, curated data sets that can be leveraged in creative ways by either independent organizations or integrated organizations. So I think that uh, we're seeing significant progress there, at least in one particular vein. And I'll be, I'm very excited to see this purpose oriented focus coming out from our corporate, you know, some of our largest corporate players uh, from a global stage because I think this is how we begin tackling really big challenges like global sustainability, uh, really truly digging into diversity, equity, and inclusion solutioning. You know, we have the opportunity to address some of these really big problems with the relaxation of this proprietary mentality towards our data. So, so would you say tying the, the notion of being a purpose-driven company almost to a form of building goodwill and all the way even to kind of getting more consumer and brand reputation, uh, how, how far can you connect the dots? Can you, do you have a, any sort of example or, or metric from some company that because of their activities, it actually led to more sales. Um, are we at a point where, where someone has, has quantified that? So there has been, uh, you know, millennial data. Millennials are now the largest portion of the workforce in the United States. They are um, also representing a significant number of the uh, official decision makers in corporate roles today. And our data and research from the marketing perspective for many years has shown 
that the millennial generation has a very strong interest in creating positive outcomes and creating purpose-oriented organizations and pursuits. And so we are now, as a result of them, uh, you know, getting into this powerful buying period of their lives, both from a personal perspective, as well as from a B2B perspective through their leadership roles, we're starting to see those decisions drive, you know, drive to specific out, um, revenue impacts. So yes, you can definitely draw a line um, today between organizations who are taking a very specific stance from a purpose orientation and being able to make that tie into revenue generation. And that is only going to accelerate, certainly as we look into 2021 and past that. So um, that's, that linkage now exists and there are um, definitely examples of that. I'm gonna use one that is, uh, you know, uh, again, no, no, uh, no particular right or wrong here, right? I'm just going to use an example of Nike choosing from a marketing perspective to go all in with supporting, um, with supporting Colin Kaepernick, for example. At the time, there was a question from a marketing perspective whether that was a good move for them. The reality is that their target market their target market is very supportive of that kind of purpose-oriented, get behind a movement mentality. And they have seen their revenues. It'd be very interesting for you to go and, and look at Nike's revenues and what has happened. They took an immediate drop, of course, after making such a strong political statement from a marketing perspective. And now you've seen that shoot up for them. So they were very much focused on using the data so what they did was a data analysis of who their core customers were and who their core customers were projected to be. And they were willing to sacrifice a certain percentage of those individuals who were their clients before and they knew were at risk of no longer supporting them because the data showed that going kind of all in from a marketing perspective and in support of that movement would ultimately drive revenues for them. And that has absolutely proven to be true for them. Great, thank you. Okay, I wanted to, to thank you both for, for being on this event. So we'll be getting the recording ready and also out to all the people who were not able to join due to technical difficulties. Um, unfortunate that these things happen uh, nowadays. So uh, again, thank you very much, and uh, we'll uh, we'll be in touch ab about the about the group and the future events. Thanks, Alec. Yep. Thank you, Alec. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye.